limited amount of time. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bill Naiman's Bogus Hangout. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Doc? Hello, Doc Sheldon here of Intrinsic Value SEO in Search News Central. Zara? Oh, Zara Altair, Zara Altair writes. Steve? And I guess that makes me Steve Grinzer from Steam Driven Media. And I am Bill Swalski from SEO and Go Fish Digital. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I've been seeing a, a 1,500 SEO experts survey that uh, Mars. Turo uh, produced. And they're including things in it that I'm questioning. The questioning? <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I got down about uh, 10, 12 lines into it and didn't even bother to read any further. Since I came across about the third or fourth thing, it was definitely not a ranking factor. I said, no, nah, this is bullshit. <laughs> um, so I asked Danny Sullivan on Twitter uh, about one of them. And he, he was really wondering why I was asking that. Hmm. <laughs> It, it was SEO's belief that facts within web pages are accurate within search results, and it's a ranking bonus having verified uh, facts that are accurate. That's what everybody was talking about. See, I don't yeah, know. I'll follow that thread. Yeah. Yeah. Doc, you're fading into the sunset. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> There's worse places to fade into. <laughs> now I, I saw that discussion going on and I for the life of me couldn't figure out why they were even talking about it. And it's like, oh now I get it. Because <laughs> They were, you know, all of a sudden people are going to start generating all these facts. It's like, well, who, how do you know whose facts are real? And, you know, as we're back to, is Google going to be the arbiter of truth? That was always my complaint with, with Google to begin with when they would, you know, people would do things like uh, a search for buying links. And then you'd have all these link sellers pop up and then people would wonder why they got banned, you know, got their website banned because they bought links from these guys and it's like, well, you know, if Google really wanted to clean shit up, they would probably not allow search results for that. It's like, well, you're not supposed to do that. Therefore we're not going to show it to you or at least not without a disclaimer saying this is a bad idea. So Google hasn't become the all knowing Oracle yet. Yeah. No, yeah. They haven't. They haven't. They, they ran yeah. pages on the basis of links and uh, relevance on pages. Well, and, and that makes me wonder with all their new, with all their knowledge based stuff that's showing up, when are they going to start putting a disclaimer saying that the, the information in here was just harvested from somebody else's website? We're not really sure if it's true or not. I don't think they'll ever do that. Uh, but, uh, well, right up until somebody dies. So I, I, tried, I tried going into that argument with uh, Danny and confused him, but. Uh, I expected to. He <laughs> went off in the tangent of uh, pages in Google aren't ranked on the basis of popularity. He didn't like the word popularity. He called it authority. So according to Matt mm -hmm. Katz from like three or four years ago, all authority is are uh, lots of links with specific uh, anchor text that indicates that your page might be about a specific topic. Mm -hmm. So authority means there are links with that that might show that you know something about something, which is no way to indicate whether or not what you're publishing at the top of search results are correct or incorrect. Mm -mm. And being realistic, even with all of their resources and talent, there's no way in the world that Google would be capable or anybody would be capable of policing the veracity of everything on the internet. Yeah. Console, United, 
I mean, even peer-reviewed scientific documents aren't capable of doing that. Well, you know, they could always just let the Wikipedia editors take over. Because those guys are always right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ask them. That's right. So one of my favorite stories was a guy, a guy named uh, Jerron Lanier. And Jerron was a high school dropout who ended up becoming a researcher at MIT and, and uh, taught at, I think, Harvard. He was a high school dropout. He, he was also a patent holder and inventor in uh, uh, IR vision. Mm -hmm. so, so he built some goggles that were used by lots of people. And he knows his stuff. And he, uh, somebody wrote a Wikipedia article about him. And the biography said that he was an experimental filmmaker because he did a video on I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, you mentioned it. A five minute long video. <laughs> so he tried to edit it. And they get offended that he would edit his own Wikipedia article. He said, but it's wrong. It's factually wrong. <laughs> It, this I'm not a experimental filmmaker. I've done lots of other things, but I haven't done that. I made a video once on YouTube. It was a five minute video that took about five minutes to think about and make. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, trying to win an argument in the back room at Wikipedia with, when all those senior editors get involved is like peeing up a rope. Good luck. <laughs> you can't let you edit your own article that's self-promotional. Yeah. Well, at the very least, I can understand their, their position on that, but at the very least, they should be able, you know, a person should be able to say, this portion of this page is factually incorrect. Please. And they do that on some Wikipedia articles, where they put things like needs more information. And yeah, but, but who does it? Not the person who is the subject of the page. And most likely a yeah. robot that comes along and says, there isn't much here. I'm just going to put this template on this page saying there's not enough. Fix it. And I'm trying to remember, there was somebody else who went to edit something on there about them, and they wouldn't allow it to stand because there was no... Um, Secondary source. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, let me get my mom. <laughs> she can, <do> this. <laughs> can, I, can I bring a mommy's note? <laughs> I mean, uh, those guys kill me. Well, there's so much fear that people are going to take it over and, and turn it into uh, a source of spam that. Uh, they they do have notability requirements and they should share mm -hmm. information about those. They should link to those more. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah, and that concern is certainly valid. It, you know, we all know it would turn into a spam fest immediately. But uh it's just if you don't have an interconnection, you're really Fighting an uphill battle. Yeah. Uh, so I know people who used to claim to be super white hat SEOs who were trying to figure out ways to get listed in Google Scholar. And it's like, well, that's simple. Write, write an important paper that's published in a university compilation and you're set. Like, you oh, that's work. I can't just write something and submit it. And it's like, no. That's not what a scholarly article is. So there's at least one university professor who wrote an article on how to rank well based on citations from Google Scholar. He's got a bunch of scholars pissed off that he wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. <clears throat> he was a legitimate scholar, but he wanted to show up and people search for him on Google Scholar. Mm. That's funny. So there was a, a paper that came out a week or so ago that said uh, 
sources like the internet have and Google have changed around the uh, way papers are getting cited in scientific science? And the same papers keep on getting cited over and over again because of the ones people find in searches on Google? So Google sort of de destroying the diversity of research. I mean, it's not a surprise, but it's why I won't use uh, Google patent search to search for information about patents, because I want to find all patents about a specific topic, not the most relevant ones that yeah. Google thinks are most relevant. And if they're not going to show me some that I might want to see, uh, it's not the place for me to search. I'd rather search at the USBTO website. Well, it's, you know, trying to police something like Wikipedia is an intimidating task well i think the same holds true to where we started out which is you know why isn't google verifying you know like yeah. by link building like by links here you know and it's and it's well it's a little bit in my mind it's a little bit different because it puts it puts google as the search engine um in charge of censorship yeah, basically it makes them the arbiter. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. real comfortable with that idea either. Yeah, so I would rather have, you know, a link to buy your links here and caveat emptor for anybody who is actually doing that than having Google say, this is naughty, you can't post that because who knows what they're going to choose to be okay and to be not okay if we're looking at an open information system. So, well, yeah, but when you go to Google and you say, show me, you know, penny auctions, you're going to a search engine because you want to see what they can show on penny auctions, not what they like about penny auctions. Exactly. So I like the idea of an ombudsman. Here's Terry. Oh, yeah. Hey, Terry. Somebody who you can uh, ask questions to when you think there's some kind of bias going on at a source. Oh, I think that position would have a very high suicide rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, places like the Washington Post have one. And it's really popular in uh, places like Sweden and Norway. Hmm. I think it works to some degree. Having somebody who can talk to the public and talk to an organization and sort of be an interface with them makes it so that more reasonable things take place. I would have to have a, a pretty significant pay scale before I would even consider something like that because that's talk about uh, 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 in the line of fire, boy. You would want somebody with a personality like uh, Matt Cutts. He's he could, yeah. Yeah. He, he could probably handle it. Yeah. I mean, he, he basically did to a great degree, uh, but now make his, you know, put his uh, email address up on every bulletin board and multiply it times a thousand. Even, even Matt might be a little bit stretched to put up with that for any period of time. It might be overwhelming. They have a moderation queuing system, don't they? A moderation what? Queuing system at Google. I don't know. Do they? It's the one where if you have lots of questions, you have an organization that, that has lots of questions, they can vote on which questions they want to answer. Okay, to. yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. That's right. And that may no longer be around because projects 
tended to steer to Google. Yeah, they don't, I don't think that uh, transparency is really in their mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> their unspoken mission statement? Well, their mission statement had sort of disappeared. They were do no evil for many years. Yeah, I think the last thing that I heard them say was back when Eric was still there that uh, they wanted to become an answer engine. That was the last thing that really resembled a mission statement from them. They couldn't go with the dec decision engine thing? Bing beat them to it? <laughs> not, not to be confused with saying that I miss Eric because that's definitely not the case, but... Uh, Didn't like a lot of things he said, but that one definitely got a lot of attention. And it seems to be still holding true. You said that in 2017? Oh God, no, before that. I think it had to have been more like 2014, 2015. Oh, because they, they put that in the 2017 financial statement. Hmm. Yeah, it's got to be four or five years ago. I don't even remember when he left. It seems to me he'd been gone for about that long, and he there wasn't any signs of him leaving yet at that point. He'd stepped down as CEO, but he didn't leave yet at that point. Well, I'm talking, you know, when he stepped down, uh, this is well before that even. Yeah. We step down as CEO and let Larry Page take over. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was about seven years ago now. Okay. But he stayed with them for a few years. Speaking of uh, old bones, has anybody heard what Marissa Meyer is doing? if anything? <clears throat> Spending her money. <laughs> 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 laughing all the way to the bank, eh? Nothing wrong with that. Nope. Didn't she have twins or something? And she and her husband bought a fancy penthouse type place in San Francisco. They may be enjoying life. Yeah. If you can afford a fancy penthouse in San Francisco, <laughs> I think enjoying life is definitely in your future. <laughs> Were you kidding? I think it's possible, yeah. Even being able to park in front of one of those places would be expensive in San Francisco. <laughs> so what about the new uh, REL equals UGC, REL equals sponsored? A couple of Pass. So they're getting rid of no follow. Well, they are in March, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, they didn't say getting rid of it. They said start ignoring it. <laughs> so what do you use instead? Yes, they're going to take it as a hint. The, you, you're going to take it as a hint to if you use REL UGC for user generated content or REL sponsored for sponsored links. And then come March, they're going to start taking it as a hint when you use rel no follow is this because google was found on a, a, a sponsor page of the apache website where people are paying like thousands of dollars to appear no idea i don't know all i've seen of it was was the uh search engine journal article the write-up on it and then a, a rather heated thread where I see Alan was going off about it was a bunch of bullshit and too much trouble for no benefit. But he was talking like he thought you had to go back and revamp all of your existing no follow links. And they specifically said you do not need to do that. So it wasn't deprecated. 
No, not yet. Now it will start being just taken as a hint in March, but they're all well, so going to be basically all of them are just being taken as a hint. Exactly. I, I don't see what. No the, matter what they say, in my opinion, they'll always be taken as a hint because they don't want webmasters deciding what's what on the knowledge on the link graph. Well, so that's yeah. It, you know, it, that part of it won't change. I'm sure. Well, yeah, that that's the whole thing that that always struck me as as a surprise when they they announced that you could go in and and use the no follow that. What would that do to their link graph? And it, to me, that's that's something that they would want to maintain as sacrosanct. Whether they're valid links, good links, bad links or not, they would want to know about all of them. So if they want to know about them, they're certainly not going to allow you and I to decide which ones are good and bad. Doesn't make sense. I mean, it just that link graph is too important to them. I'm right. thinking Google still indexes those. Marks them as no follow. And I think they still index them. They just don't pu uh, publish it. They give you that note. Uh, hey, we know about this document, but they blocked us. Yeah. You can bet they know what's in it. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't see them making that change without being absolutely sure what they were stepping into. No, I'm sure an awful lot of thought went into that. I, just, I, th I found it a little amusing, though, that people were getting so up in arms about it. That yeah, but and it seems like every time anything happens, people get up in arms. Well, because Google has no... Listen... They can suggest stuff to act like, uh, you know, it's laws, stupid. Because they don't make up their mind and set it in stone. You know, it's all willy-nilly stuff. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know I'd go with the willy-nilly. I think it's, uh, I think most of their stuff they think through pretty well. Every now really? and then. Really? Now and then they, they'll really? pull a real boner. You think the guy, you think the guy who decided that uh, links would be a, the big factor thought through that people would actually make links that uh, he didn't think that through or they wouldn't have done it? Well, I think. They yeah. wouldn't have made it public. Pardon me? They would not have made it public. Right. Here's. Like uh -oh. my whole theory behind all of these people over there in, in that part of the world is they're all like little Montessori kids. They go to a private preschool, private schools, Ivy League college, and then straight to Google or Facebook or whatever, having never actually set foot in the real world or dealt with anybody sneaky like me and Doc and Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for including me, Steve. <laughs> You know, so it never occurs to them that somebody might take what they've done and go, how can I take advantage of this? And while it's nice to think that the rest of the world is that way, it's just not the case. And then it becomes a race to see who can abuse it the fastest until it gets shut down. And it becomes a running gun battle. And tech, the tech companies will always lose that battle because they have to play by a certain set of rules that, People like in the affiliate space selling uh, cannabis oil or whatever simply don't have to follow. I think some of the heads of some of those tech companies are the guys who you don't necessarily want to trust. And it's not going to affect them as badly. You think of a certain guy in a gray hoodie like that. Yeah, well, you know, and who's, who's the, the woman that uh, was the president of uh, Theranos? Yeah. The um, the medical device scam, which is the only word for it. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a handful of people like that, but not like not like hanging out at like ClickBank or uh, some of the other uh, affiliate marketing places, or Wicked Fire or whatever. 
some of these people, they'd lose their minds if they hung out in those places very long. I mean, look what it did to Matt Cutts. Yeah, I, I've always just thought they were pretty naive. Uh, I always say they spent, you know, they they lived in their parents' basement until they got a job at Google, and now they just go from Google to their parents' basement. They just moved to a different basement, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bigger basement. That's, oh, there's no sort of amount of truth to that, yeah. Yeah, now we're Larry and Sergey's basement. <laughs> yeah. Well, they also look at the internet differently than we do. Uh, you know, we see it as a total opportunity. They see it totally as a, you know. A, opportunity. <laughs> a, but a different type of opportunity. You know, my brother is like that. He's in that kind of crowd. He, he, he does not click on ads. He copies and pastes them. Mm -hmm. and he doesn't use the part that has the uh, payment part in it because he made a point of asking me. He un gets it off the WW part that they show in green under it. So rather than clicking on the ads, he'd rather cut and paste into the browser. Yeah, uh, believe it or not, my brother probably thinks money shouldn't be made on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I know plenty of people yeah. like that too. And I get it. And maybe if we had kept, if we had kept the internet in pieces, you know, a, a commercial public version and an academic research version, um, I would agree with him, but that's not what happened. Yeah, right. And that was how it was in the early, early, early days. Yeah, no oh, yeah. going back now, though. Oh. I'm old enough to remember getting some of the first spam email to come out of AOL. Or... My oh, first yeah. spam out of out of AOL was a uh, a CD from AOL. <laughs> <laughs> that followed oh, by yeah. another 1,786 CDs. <laughs> I, I know it probably won't come as much of a surprise, but one of the first real serious spammers on the internet was a freaking lawyer <laughs> chasing after clients. So I can't, I can believe it. Cause if you're starting out a lawyer, you have a lot of high costs. Like you're still paying for going to school probably. And, uh, you know, back then, I remember uh, uh, working for a company that cut their budget, like, way, way, way down by quit advertising in the yellow pages and just use the internet. That's used to how I sold uh, web development, actually, was to say, well, you'll get more customers from this than you will from yellow pages and that was true then and even more true now for near anything if you want to sell anything you have to be on the internet i have a Pretty friend much. in a solo law firm and he was two weeks too late to sign up for the yellow pages his uh firm closed like a month later because he was in no clients this is before right. the pages. Right. And it was expensive. Like, I remember when uh, I first started with that client, I think it was their website cost less than three or four months of advertising on in the yellow pages. Yeah, it definitely wasn't cheap. And they have plenty of sneaky clauses like uh, you didn't sign an annual contract. You signed a contract until they released the next phone book. Right. So if they chose not to release a phone book for an extra six months or eight months, guess who has to keep paying? Well, and then at the end there was, 
you got the big phone book from the phone company and then all those little directors yeah. you got four, yeah. or five, four or five of those little directors sitting around on top of the phone <laughs> book. Yeah, I know a lot, knew a lot of people that, that made pretty good bank putting together new directory books. You know, local that was some stuff. of the first telemarketing companies out there. That's what they were selling. I did one of those back in the... 80s. What a directory? Yep. Hill Country in Texas, down around Austin. About 180 pages worth of, of business ads, little display ads, and I yep. undercut the hell out of the yellow page ads and still made good money. But the problem was it's something like that because these were relatively small local businesses that they're you know, out in the, in the rural areas, they didn't really care to do this every year. You know, I think right. once, until the ink fades so they can't be read, this thing is good for the next six or seven years, you know, so it was a one-time shot. You back again? <laughs> yeah. What the hell? We just did this three years ago. What do I would want to do it again? You know, because I got new, you've got competitors that are coming up. You know what? Two of them? Big deal. <laughs> But it, you know, it was a short flash in the pan, but it, it made some money. And I was one of thousands in Texas that did it. You know, every, every uh, community had them. Yeah. Because it's, it made it easier to find businesses. Usually they were set up differently. So it's a lot easier. Well, yeah, like you know, the one that we did was basically uh, – set up by categories you know so you had your carpenters and you had your plumbers yeah. and you had your lawyers and you had your dentists and you know all these different so you might have 12 pages of of doctors mm -hmm. but it was easy to to find them and then within the doctor category we had it broken up by a community you know the closest one to Wimberley, the closest to Buda, yeah. the closest to kyle you know and it was it was great but uh now you do the same thing, but on the internet. Have, have any of you joined a BNA, BNI organization, business network? I have heard of it, but no. No? Yeah, I've been, I've been in a couple. I was in one about five years ago, and uh, they were expecting me to personally refer people to them one person at a time. Yeah, we called that multi-level marketing. <laughs> no, no I, I called it ignorance of the internet. <laughs> oh, okay. I SEO. I, I can reach thousands of people. Do you want me to send you one person at a time? <laughs> You'll send me one person at a time in exchange. Boy, that sounds fair. I'll just go to a blogger and get 30 at a time, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I had a guy reach out to me this week to see if I want to join one of those. <laughs> it really is group dependent, though. I've been in a few that were just like that, that were just absolutely horrible. And I've been in a couple that if you weren't in that group, you weren't going to get to the really good clients that everybody wants. I would think that they'd be more effective <laughs> in, a, in a very tight niche, you know. Well, the big thing, I mean, the thing is, is they don't want to have people who do the same thing in the same group. Yeah. So, but it, it became more of a getting into the group, the right group, more for networking with more CEOs than trying to get customers. Yeah. Yeah, I just, that's, that never really made a lot of sense to me. Just, I just couldn't see it. That's a great way to spend breakfast once a month. Yeah, they were having a meeting at a, a nearby restaurant. It's Oceanside. And it's a beautiful place. The Chart House in Cardiff. Uh, it would probably be a great breakfast, but I don't see getting much business out of it. Yeah, but if you really only need one or two new clients, it might be worth paying for it for a month or two. Well, 
they're like industry type events I go to where I meet the, those one or two clients. Well, it's like I never used to go to the marketing, this SEO conferences or anything like that. I went to jewelry conferences and places where customers were going to be, not where more people doing the same thing I'm doing. Yeah, that, look, why, why would you want to hobnob with com competition when you could hobnob with buyers? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's uh, that works if your clients are SEOs. When Dave and I were doing yeah. uh, consulting for SEOs, we got some good clients from speaking at SES. Well, I think, you know, I, guess I spoke at SES. For, for us, I think, you know, networking with our colleagues is, is uh, productive. You know, I get, I do most of my business via referrals. So, you know, it, it's certainly a plus. I mean, plus just the fact that I would love to go to, say, PubCon and meet some of the folks that I only know online. But, you know, for prospecting, I don't think that PubCon would be the place to be. I, like Steve is saying, someplace where site owners are going is where I would want to be if I'm prospecting for new clients. To me, that's going to be more productive than than networking with my colleagues slash competitors. Uh, best, best one I ever went to was a uh, jewelry convention conference where uh, one of the keynote speakers was going on and on about how impossible it was to sell jewelry online. And you couldn't do it, don't even bother. He spent $30,000 and made one sale for about 1200 bucks. And I smiled. And, Wait, waited until the end and then I got to go up and speak and presented three of my clients who we pushed past a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in sales and <laughs> <laughs> line up here whoever wants to pay the most gets to hire me next <laughs> uh, years, years ago I was marketing manager for a company down in Austin we manufactured a system an engineered system for a portable park it next to your, your data center and it would power, you had a UPS, a diesel generator, automatic transfer switch for disaster recovery. And he gave me the first year he let me go to NCC at McCormick up in Chicago for the National Computer Conference to build a booth and dim, you know, display our product. And he gave me $10,000. That was everything. My travel, my meals, the booth rental, the equipment, everything, 10 grand. Okay which was a real shoestring budget for something like that. It, you know, I basically bought my own breakfast. Okay? <laughs> and I got a client up there that, uh, you know, that I made contact with. We sold it for $700,000 at a 12% profit margin. Well, the next year he gave me $50,000. <laughs> and he whined the whole time, but he gave me the budget. And I put together a decent booth and I actually took a, a miniature mock-up of our of our system and the idiots at the at mccormick when they placed us they normally they try not to place lily right in front of 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 some you know they're not going to put a competitor right in front of another competitor they try to space you out a little bit so that you're not face to face and they put my only national competitor literally across the aisle and I thought, oh, shit, <laughs> this is going to be bad. And I was already set up when they showed up. And they, and they came with a crew of like 12 guys. And they're staging right. everything. And they're bringing in crates and crates and crates. And they start assembling their mock-up. Well, my mock-up was about 24 inches tall. Theirs was like 